Hello, everyone, and welcome. So welcome to day two of the QI Learning Academy's final presentations for the third cohort of this group. Um, we have been treated yesterday to uh, nine presentations, and we've got several more lined up today. Um, this group, in, in case you, you um, uh, did, missed it yesterday, um, is a group that is finishing the second quarter of the Complex Systems uh, Research Methods for a Changing Planet course plus internship. The students learned about persuasive writing and problem solving tools and complex systems analysis and have put those skills together on a group research project with interdisciplinary teams and working with either faculty and staff here at the university or with some partners from outside. And we're really excited to see the fruits of their efforts. It's been fantastic. I'd like to now take a moment to introduce um, Professor Ramesh Rao, who's the director of the Qualcomm Institute and who is responsible for, for getting this opportunity underway. Ramesh. You're muted. Okay, so uh, I wanted to thank Dr. Shikhasky and share with those of you uh, that are uh, here with us today uh, that uh, the Qualcomm Institute has been around for a long time, more than two decades as primarily uh, a research enterprise. But in recent years, we've been called upon by the campus to play a larger role in creating educational opportunities for our students. And that is the backdrop against which uh, we established the Learning Academy where the idea was to be able to have students from multiple disciplines, such as yourselves, come together to apply what we're learning through the courses we are taking to solve real societal scale problems. And so uh, I think this represents an, uh, uh, an effort on our part to be able to not only take advantage of the resources we have, but also plug in with programs like the seventh college and the eighth college uh, uh, is on track to stand up, which has to do with uh, project courses as part of college requirements. So we are wanting to learn through these experiments uh, and see uh, what it would take for us to be able to scale it up. So we might be able to host hundreds of students uh, in, in, in this program. I have myself had the opportunity to work with uh, teams uh, and mentor them and I have enjoyed it. Uh, I think this method uh, works very well. I think uh, the teams come in prepared to do the research and uh, I'm looking forward to listening to the presentations uh, this afternoon, uh, including one team that uh, I had the opportunity to mentor myself. <laughs> Thanks, Leah. Thank you, Ramesh. Absolutely. So um, without further ado, I'd like to get going with our first group. Um, this is a candidate assessment group. And the mentorship here is actually shared. Um, initially, we uh, had brought uh, Mike Roberts, uh, who is a uh, entrepreneur in residence here at UC San Diego. And I got to know Mike through his um, fantastic efforts in expanding opportunities in technical employment in our community. So Mike has actually written the California standards for the software, um, for, for a software engineering apprenticeship program. Uh, and he is really trying to expand that apprenticeship opportunity. And in that vein, is really interested in how we might um, assess candidates for opportunities like this one uh, in ways that don't require him to individually interview everyone, right? So, so this is the, the backdrop for what was a, uh, our students were challenged with. And I think you'll see that they came up with a wonderfully creative solution um, that they will share with you today. Okay, take it away. Um, okay, uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I don't think, can anyone see my screen? Okay. It says it's coming up. Um, it was just taking a moment. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm sorry, let me just try this again because sometimes it, it doesn't share so <laughs> Absolutely. If not, I, I think I also have the link. No, it's okay. Um, great. Let's try it again. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Can everyone see this? Looks yeah, great. Okay, perfect. Hi everyone, we are the Canada Assessment Team. We would like to thank you all for taking the time to listen to our presentation. I wanted to take some time to introduce our team. Next slide, please. So I am Hannah. Um, hello everyone, I'm Esmeralda. Hi, I'm Jenna. Hi, I'm Josie. In this project, we partner with Santa Co School and help them improve the Canada Assessment. They're an apprenticeship program that brings in diverse talent at San Diego into the tech industry. The apprentices get paid to learn software development and then get real world experience uh, by working on real projects. Um, so next slide. To help you understand San Diego Code School problem, I wanted to invite you to answer the following question. Have you used dating app before? You can type in the chat. Okay, so my next question is that how you talk to everyone, and I mean everyone who got matches with you. <laughs> I see more no uh, respond in this question compared to the previous one. This is the analogy we use when we think about the candidate assessment problem. Like law seekers, employer at San Diego Coast School held an overwhelming amount of candidates to choose from, but limited time and resources to go over all of them. Yet when they restrict themselves to people they found first, they might miss out on other potential people who are better fit for them. Uh, so that's why we held this problem school. How to have San Diego Coast School screen through a large pool of candidates while identify talents for the program. Um, to answer this question, we, do, we conduct a gap analysis. We compare the current state, and the design stage so we can develop an action plan to push the gap between the two states. So I would like to uh, firstly talk about the current state. Canada, next slide please. Canada has to go through three rounds before being accepted. Applicant will firstly submit the resume and cover layer and then they do a veto interview and the employers will watch the veto and rate it using a rubric. The past applicants will meet in person and have a panel interview with three other employers. Daniel Coast School worries that when the program becomes more popular and receives more applicants, they will have to cap on the number of applicants and miss out on other potential talents who they don't have the chance to consider. To prevent miss out on other potential talent who they don't have the chance to consider, um, to prevent overlooking talents, they want to replace the video interview round, which is the second one in this uh, chart over here uh, with an automated behavioral assessment that can immediately uh, provide score after the candidate completes the assessment. So now we'll talk about the desired state, how we want the assessment to look like. There are two things that we consider, one is efficiency and the other one is effectiveness. Uh, for efficiency, we want that regardless of the number of applicants, employer can screen all the candidates who apply without spending too much time on the assessment. For effectiveness, um, San Diego Coast School um, doesn't want to discriminate against under-resourced applicants at San Diego. They specifically don't want to measure applicants' coding skill and the education uh, background because they might not have the resources to do so. And instead of measuring the aptitude, the program wants to focus on the behavior that indicate the potential of becoming a good software developer. What that means is that the person does not currently have the in-state skill yet, but they have the potential to obtain them. And um, so what skill should we measure? So when we do more research in this, um, we think that learning agility might be the answer for this problem. Um, learning agility is the willingness and the ability to learn from experience and then apply that lesson to novel situation. Um, many research has shown like a positive relationship between learning agility and performance outcome. Uh, one study such as uh, Lombarder and Ichinger uh, research found that learning actually significantly predicts supervisory rating of uh, being promoted and then performance after being promoted. Um, that's the reasons why we think that learning actually um, can be an indicator of applicants potential of becoming a good software developers. And I will pass on to Amisra to talk more about the action plan. 
Um, so in order to achieve our desired state, um, we created an action plan as part of our gap analysis. Um, our plan consisted of several measurable qualities, since our goal was to quantify candidates' possible potential. Um, so in order to do so, we decided to measure uh, time spent on a task, number of attempts made in a task, and whether the user completed or didn't complete a task. Um, additionally, uh, for, for the sake of efficiency and effectiveness, we decided to try to make an easily accessible assessment that could be virtual, taken anywhere at any time, and um, allow an expansion of the pool of candidates to a larger number. Um, so our solution was to create an online web-based game. Um, this game's goal is to measure learning agility through object recognition. Um, like my partner Hannah mentioned, learning agility consists of learning lessons from experience and applying them to a variety of situations. Um, so in this case, we pair these concepts with the Griebel study, which consists of graphic graphic figurines with like distinct characteristics. And our goal for this game is to measure how well users are able to learn and distinguish their configuration parts. Um, so my partner Jenna will talk more about the Griebles. So what are Griebles? Um, Griebles are a sort of category of novel objects that are often used as stimuli in psychology studies of object and facial recognition. Um, they were most famously created by Isabel Gauthier, who used them to study recognition of complex objects and the brain areas activated by this recognition. And since then, they've been in more than 25 scientific articles on perception. So that's why we decided it was necessary to utilize Griebel's as a foundation for our game because they are already established and validated by the scientific community and there's data that already exists for it. So that will give us something accurate to compare to and help us validate certain trends. So Griebel's are distinguishable based on the configuration of their parts and one can categorize them into different genders and families. As you can see in this chart, um, Griebel's are grouped into two different made up genders and five made up families based on the similarities between how their features are configured. So the specific study that we took inspiration from was a study done by Gauthier in which participants were trained to become Griebel experts or trained to become experts in identifying sets of Griebel's, i.e. categorizing them into their correct gender and family. So in this experiment, the participants were required to go through mm -hmm. a training procedure where they would learn the different labels of each Griebel and then go through tasks where they would practice applying what they, act, what they learned. So this included inspecting the Griebel's and then later seeing if they could label the Griebel's themselves. So this study um, specifically focused on analyzing visual recognition mechanisms, but essentially what we wanted to do was run a very similar experiment, except we wanted to focus on how well a participant learns or adapts to a new set of information. So we wanted to use Griebel's because um, the Griebel experiment because it put people in a novel situation and it would be a good uh, uh, foundation where we could build a game and analyze how well people can absorb um, new information. So here I'm going to go into a video demonstration of our game. Um, this is just a prototype of our game, but the premise is that the player are space scientists and they're, they're, um, they're trying to train and be an expert in sorting Griebel's and Griebel's are aliens on different planets. So here's the quick introduction for player. And then in the first phase is the gender inspection phase where the scientists, the player, will actually learn about the gender and try to get familiar with it. They're not sorting anything, they're just getting familiar with this, with their gender in this phase. So here are the different type of Griebel's. They go through that. Then they go into sorting the actual Griebel's. So this is the two gender, block and clip. And so they will sort the Griebel's and whenever they get the Griebel's wrong, there's actually a beep in the background. Um, it's not shown here because uh, there's some technical 
difficulties, but in the actual game, there's a beep whenever they get it wrong. So after they're done sorting the um, gender, they turned off the greebles, they go into learning the different types of families. So there's five different groups. Um, there's five families for greebles. And as before, they, they learn and they can rotate their greebles and they go through different types of families to get familiar with them. Then they actually go into sorting the families. So there's the five um, different groups. And as they sort, whenever they get it wrong, there's a beep in the background again. There's no feedback, just the beeping sound. After that, they go into, um, they go into actually um, sorting the family once again. But then what's different between this round and the round prior is that there's actually feedback. And which means that um, whenever they get the um, greeble wrong, the name of the correct greeble is on the screen. And they also hear the beep in the background. So we wanna do this because we wanna learn about learning agility. And by providing feedback, we wanna measure how different their performance is before they get the feedback and after they get the feedback. So by, by getting the feedback in this round, we want to test again. And we want to test again after, where this is still the round with feedback. But after that, there's the round without feedback again. And we want to see how their performance improved. So that's, um, that's the prototype of our game. There's still a lot more to add, and I'll touch on that later. So I want to talk about what we have learned um, from this project. So we spent around 20 weeks on this project and we have learned a lot of things. First of all, we learned how to problem solve. So we learned how to use gap analysis and problem framing to come to a conclusion that we want to create a game. Secondly, we learned how to conduct literature search. Um, this is something we learned in the beginning of the project where we've learned about gamification, we learned about learning agility, we learned about greebles, and we put all those ideas together to propose our new research ideas. Our new research ideas is um, adapting old research ideas to measure things that we want to measure. And finally, we, wanna, we, we learned how to collaborate with developers and with each other. So there are several things we want to do in the future. First of all, we want to incorporate eye tracking in the game. Eye tracking allows us to attract the attention of the player and also to see their commitment to playing the game and finishing it. Secondly, we want to finish creating the retraining phase. So the retraining phase is actually a phase where we reshuffle the labels of the greebles. So they need to get really familiar with the families of the greebles again. And by doing so, we get to increase the validity of our experiment. Next, we, we want to collect mass data to increase accuracy. And this is the part where the audience can help, where you can play the game so we can collect more data and then we can see how accurate our game is. Then we want to improve the sign and usability of the game. We want to make sure that the game is um, aesthetically pleasing and we want to make sure that everything is, the instructions are clear and the buttons are there. And lastly, we want to deploy the game for San Diego Code School and see correlations between future candidates' success and game prediction. This has been our goal since the very first day, and we want to see how accurate um, our game is at the end and to see if it actually predicts what we want to see. So um, I want to give a big thank you for Leanne, Mike, Khalil, and everyone else at Palm for being amazing mentors and collaborators. Um, we welcome the audience for any constructive criticism for improving our game. So if you have any feedback or criticism, feel free to contact us through our emails listed here. And that concludes our presentation. I'm going to open up the floor for any questions from the audience. Wonderful. Great job. And I, I, I look forward to uh, when your link is uh, ready for public use, right? You know, so, so it's a private itch.io link, but very soon uh, there is a back end data collection engine there. Um, it will be for everyone. Yes. And Mike says, amazing job. Look forward to testing it out. Fantastic. So questions from the audience.
this project integrated a number of different pieces. You know, uh, there's several people in this group who have uh, psychology and cognitive science backgrounds. Um, and so it was, it was particularly nice to see the integration of that um, work into something that's designed for workforce development needs. questions okay i i have a question so so what kinds of you you know you talked about data coming in on the back end what what exactly do you think you're going to be looking for right now, now that now that we understand the environment or the understand the, the game and the goals um what do you, what exactly are you going to be tracking um okay so we want to track um a like the time they took to complete the game and also um, the percentage of error. And then we contrast, compare and contrast um, before the training, before the feedback round and after feedback round. And Jenna, you can add on. Uh, yeah, there are several things, obviously, as Josie mentioned, like the accuracy or percent correct, but also um, one of the main things we plan on doing is like the spread of the mistakes or like the distance between the mistakes, because um, we want to see if, you know, if they make a mistake or a few mistakes in the beginning, will they ever make mistake again? So, or versus have been, are they make, like, making con mistakes consistently? Um, also uh, other minor things like average um, response time or speed, like um, for each greeble, um, and also comparing like the number of tries they take to like reach a perfect score. Um, basically seeing if there's any like metrics we can use to see if there's like an improvement. Nice, yes, your reaction time is, is going to be very sensitive. And unfortunately you have 25 papers worth of literature to look at to see what other people have looked at to see uh, how to characterize, um, in this case, perceptual learning, but, um, but the speed with which people learn. Well done, congratulations. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that uh, uh, some of you uh, have caught the um, game development, because it game design and development bug. <laughs> Fantastic, okay. Um, so there is, there is much to say about uh, the collaboration that happened here, right? But it, you know, not only as, as they, the students uh, so clearly called out in the end, they learned to collaborate with us, with each other, but, you know, they were making a game and none of these folks are um, developers in their own right. Although they're interested now in learning a little bit about development. Um, it may be a lot about development, but um, the, you know, it, what, what was nice is that the Qualcomm Institute has resources for students to really lean into to create these kinds of really multidisciplinary projects. And in particular, this group worked with my team at Pong to, to you know, really make um, their design, which, um, which, which they did the whole long design doc um, and, and uh, really worked with our team to make it happen. So, so great team effort, wonderful. I think we might be um, a little bit concerned with missing a person or two um, with the next team. Is that, is that correct? Uh, correct, we are missing a few members of team two. Okay. So I wonder then if we take a five minute break or if we, I think maybe it would be worth taking like a stretch break um, because I don't wanna get people offset um, because people expect the other presentations to come at the, the right time. And so if we started another presentation in that time block, I think there would be some concern about um, missing a presentation that you, you aim to, to come and catch. Okay, so um, yeah, jumping jacks, stretches, um, whatever, whatever works for you. Joyce, perhaps if you can put the, um, the banner back up for a few minutes and I'll see if I can get a hold of uh, some of these students. Thank you, wonderful.
Hello, everyone. Apologies for that little interlude. Um, I'd like to point out that it was no fault of our students who were eagerly awaiting to present, but for some reason have been Zoom blocked. That's right. It's been a year since we talked about Zoom bombing, but these students were actually blocked by Zoom. Um, but they're here now, and I'm very excited to introduce to you a team that um, has been working on a vagus nerve wearable sensor that is um, really sort of the, the um, culmination of many years of research from our own um, Professor Ramesh Rao. Uh, so he is the mentor for this team, and they are going to tell you about the work that they've done to make this more usable um, and, and uh, accessible to uh, as, as a product to the public. And without further ado, take it away, team. Hello. So I will be sharing my screen. All right, uh, thank you, Leanne, for the introduction. Um, my name is Darren, and I'll be presenting the Vegas Nerve Wearable Sensor Project on behalf of Nick Lee, uh, myself, and Sherry Ma, uh, mentored by Dr. Ramesh Rao and Sundar Rangarajan. Next. So before we get into the project, I kind of want to talk about the background of the project. So I want to uh, make a point about the history of wearable sensors. So in recent history, wearable sensors have been becoming more popular and growing in demand because people are becoming more aware of their physical activity and fitness and paying attention more to the activities they're doing and their uh, overall health. Next. So this is where the Bliss Buzzer comes in. A Bliss Buzzer is a form of a wearable sensor as well. Um, but its main focus is tracking the emotional and mental well-being of its user. So as you can see from the picture shown here, uh, the bliss buzzer is worn around the, the chest and it's connected via an interface on your mobile device. Next. So the problem we want to address is, main, is mainly tied to the interface of the bliss buzzer. Next. So the problem we encountered with the interface of the bliss buzzer is that, well, firstly, it has an unappealing aesthetic. So as you can see, it's very dark. Um, there's large numbers on the screen and there's confusing terminology that is presented without really an understanding of uh, a basic understanding for the user of what those words are. Um, secondly, it's difficult to navigate. So there's a lot of hidden features on the interface that are hard to find and hard to uh, manipulate. Uh, we personally found features way after using the interface initially. So we it was a, it was really hard to find the features like between the certain pages of the interface. And as we said, the confusing technology technical terminology of the interface, such as the NN50, PNN50, and HRV words, we felt that if a general user was using the interface, they would be really confused as what to as to what those terms were. Next, uh, there's a lack of data visualization. So uh, we kind of want to implement uh, a better way to view the data that is being read from the Bliss Buzzer. Uh, a lot of data has been collected by the Bliss Buzzer already over the years and is accumulated on the Bliss Buzzer website. So the problem is we there's no integration between the data on the website and the interface, and we wanted to solve that. And probably most of all, there's poor user engagement. So there's not a lot of intimacy between the user and the interface itself. Next. Uh, thank you, Darren. Uh, before diving further into our project, I would like to take a time to briefly go over the science and theory behind our project itself. Uh, so to provide users with valuable feedback, health feedbacks, uh, the Bliss Buzzer ecosystem utilizes uh, one key health marker, which is our heart rate variability, HRV for short. It is simply just a measurement of the variability or the time interval and in the spacing between our heartbeats. So another way to understand this is that if your heart rate is significantly higher, your HR will be, will be lower since the interval between each of your heartbeat is lower. 
And um, so why is HRV significant? Um, it is also another measurement of how of the balance between our sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. And a healthy heart should be the one that can switch gears rapidly and regularly between these two systems. Next. Um, so most of our bodily functions are governed by our autonomic nervous system, which can be broken down into our sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. Um, our sympathetic nervous system is often known as our natural fight or flight response. And it is a good system to have in place to help us effectively respond to occasional stressors, such as when we do in a high intensity workout, or maybe we're having a future deadline coming up, or even a potential physical danger lying ahead. And it is often associated with a low HRV or a higher heart rate in general. While the system is good to help us get out of dire situation occasionally, a prolonged time spent in the state is oftentimes problematic for our health since our body will have to endure unnecessary stress as our brain will be flooded with cortisol, a stress hormone, and which is a leading cause to many of our stress-related illnesses. Next. On the other hand, we have our parasympathetic nervous system, which often function as a brake or like a moderator by disabling our paras uh, by disabling our sympathetic nervous system. It is due as the rest and digestive, re digestive response. And when this system is, in, is active, it is indicative of a rel relaxed state of presence. And it is associated with a higher HRV or a longer interval between heartbeats and a lower heart rate. The more time you spend in this system, the better moods, willpower, and health you will have. Next. So to measure the um, activity between these two systems, uh, the Plus Buzzer um, utilized one key statistics, which is the NN50 and PNN50. An NN50 event is just the event, like occurrence during which your heart, um, the during which the interval between each of your successive heartbeat exceeds 50 milliseconds, which is fairly high. And it is indicative of an active parasympathetic nervous system. So you are more relaxed during this. And a, PP, a PNN50 is um, measured by dividing the number of NN50 occurrences by the total number of intervals, which is, the, which is just the interval between each of your successive heartbeat. Next. Um, so for the application, so HRV is a health marker. It indicates one readiness to tackle stress, willpower, and positive emotions. It can be measured through a wearable sensor, whether it be a chest strap, a ring, or a smartwatch. Uh, the data it collected will be integrated into our mobile app that will help you keep tabs of the activities that relax your state of mind for future reference. And it's also a way to learn more about yourself. So building upon the context and problems that Darren and Nick have discussed in previous slides, we decided to start our redesign process for the application interface with many brainstorm sessions. Um, we sketched out uh, our preliminary ideas on paper and discussed the new features that we wanted to include. Here are some sketches that we decided to move forward with. Before presenting a quick demo of our interface prototype on Figma, which is a prototyping software that we used, um, here's a quick overview of the new features that we were hoping to incorporate. In our current design, we have an onboarding, ex onboarding personalized experience, an activity diary, a reward system that, has, that includes customizable avatar, suggestions of healthy activities, as well as other general improvements of the app interface, which, which include a more appealing and modern appearing design, inclusion of plots uh, for HRV values, and and PNN50 events, as well as definitions for technical terminologies. And here I'll be presenting like a quick demo on Figma. So we first start with an onboarding experience, which can also be personalized to help the user navigate the application better. Um, here we recognize um, here we recognize that the user may not prefer giving out too much personal information to register before trying the app. So we're offering an option to let them try as a guest uh, only with phone numbers for one week. 
Then it will prompt the user to connect the device to the Bliss Buzzer track via um, Bluetooth. It will then ask if they would like to um, turn on notifications. And the last part of the onboarding experience is a short, like personalized questionnaire to get to know the user better. Here is um, the home screen with a general overview of the user's personal um, avatar here. Uh, you can see the avatar is happy, um, a summary of their HRV, number, um, average number of HRV, uh, average number of NN50 events for today, um, as well as recent activities. The next section is our activity diary. This gives uh, the user a better data visualization of their HRV values, as well as their NN50 events for today. They can also log and keep track of a history of the activities that they engaged today in here. Then we have an explore page where you can see um, guided programs for meditation, mindful sessions, or yoga that you can follow, bedtime stories, or even some comedies that you can watch. And last but not least, here's a detailed page for your avatar. Um, the idea is um, by, you can take better care of your well, well, uh, physical and mental well-being by checking and taking care of this virtual character. Um, you can see new activities that are suggested. Also, you can customize your avatar by choosing different faces, even little animals. You can customize it with uh, different skin colors as well as hair colors. And that's it. Let's go back to our demo. Um, I mean, PowerPoint. So next, we will kind of want to discuss the conclusions and results that we had from the project. Next. So for the future work of this project, we would like to implement more backend programming um, because this project was mostly done on Figma, which was a design software. Uh, we didn't really get to do that much coding to um, kind of see how the integration between the Bliss Buzzer and the interface would work out. Uh, next, we would want to do more user trials. So um, have the general public and various different groups of people test out our interface and see how it works for them. Uh, this will be good because it'll give us a lot of positive feedback and negative feedback so we know what mistakes we can improve on and what other changes we can make to the interface to make it better. Um, we would like to integrate the interface even more, so encourage more user engagement and kind of increase that intimacy between the user and the interface. So doing so, uh, we would like to implement maybe more wind up features or more additional or additional activities for people with varying lifestyles. Next. And we kind of want to stress the importance and cultural and social impact we want to have from this project on the general public. From through this project, we kind of want the meaning of HRV to become more uh, known by a lot more people. Uh, we want people to know what HRV is and what HRV means to them and how it's connected to your uh, mental and emotional well being. And through this interface and the improvements of the Bliss Buzzer itself, we kind of want to make an impact on the wearable sensor technology field and kind of give ideas for further research to improve wearable sensors and to incorporate them into everyday life. Next. So in summary, we want, we hope that you uh, can take a lot from this project and we hope that the interface can bring awareness to HRV and make the general public more conscious of their emotional, um, emotional and mental well-being and to take care of their bodies going into the future. Uh, please let us know if you have any questions or comments and thank you. Wonderful. That, that is adorable. I could see myself using that app. <laughs> <laughs>
nicely done. Uh, so, so um, questions first from for the audience. Anyone have any questions of the group? Um, so Ara is putting a question in chat, which I will read out. Thanks for the great presentation. Um, what were the engagement measures that helped uh, determine that helped? Uh, um, yes, that helped determine um, by by your team that the previous system had low engagement, and what specific aspects of the new design targets for this improvement? Um, so I think there wasn't specific measurements we made, but just. Um, just our personal experience with the, the previous interface. Um, we, when we got the device and the bliss buzzer, we kind of used the, the app itself and we kind of see, we kind of like looked at how we interacted with the interface and we all just had like this general consensus that it was um, not very well designed and it wasn't very accessible to like the everyday user. Um, uh, so that's why it was, we thought that was like a major problem with the bliss buzzer and we wanted to tackle that problem. Yeah, I think Ara is particularly interested because she too is uh, obsessed with the user experience uh, and she works uh, with us in that capacity at Pong. Um, and it's particularly difficult. I mean, you're dealing with a phone app and you need a sensor right now during the pandemic, it's kind of hard to get massive amounts of, of uh, user research when you're requiring people to put something on. Um, <laughs> but um, but that's definitely a goal I'm, I'm taking it, right, is to, is to get some actual user, user data. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Other comments, questions from the audience? Okay. We're, we're actually, if we move on, if there are no other questions, I want to congratulate this group. Well done. Yay. Uh, and, and, and move on because we'll, we'll be able to catch up. Again, no fault of, of theirs, uh, something very funny happened with Zoom um, and we're hoping it doesn't happen again with the rest of the students. Okay, so I'm gonna queue up the next uh, team. This is the decision tree um, team. So this, this group is um, talking about sequential decision-making um, and the mentor for this group is um, the technical director at Pong, Joseph Snyder. Um, and he is, this is the first time he's, he's mentoring a group, but I think uh, we will all see that it, it's gone very well. And uh, the three students will be presenting their work. Um, yes, they're all here. Wonderful, take it away. Okay, um, hi everyone. We are the Decision Tree team and we worked on a game that studies multi-level decision making. And so today we will be walking you through our project and version 1.0 of the game. Our goals as we familiarize ourselves with the project, the current version and future goals that we have. This is the team, I'm Ilma and I worked on the front end more technical side and logistics. Hi everyone, I'm Olivia and I also worked on the front end, but more on the creative side towards artwork and also the logistics. And I'm Shay, I worked primarily in the back end. And then as Leanne mentioned, our mentor, Joe Snyder, who works with Pong, and then he's also the CTO at Brain Lead Technologies. So the initial 1.0 version of the game was a 2D game that was created with the intention, intention of studying decision making and research, evaluating short term versus long term and how people weigh those. So here's a video of a user playing the game and initially there's a login screen, but unfortunately we weren't able to capture that on the recording. But for the game itself, the user makes a choice to go either left or right using arrow keys at each node or circle. And since larger nodes represent larger rewards, the user must try and choose the path that ends up maximizing their rewards. So that way they are weighing out short term versus long term with each path they choose to take. So the game you just saw was used in a, a study done by Joseph Snyder, Dong Kyo Lee, Howard Poisner, and Sergei Gepstein. 
and it's called the Perspective Optimization with Limited Resources. The point of the paper was to understand decision making more. So they basically took, as you see on the left image, a user and they set them down and had them play the same game over and over again. And then on the right is just kind of a general mapping of the generic decision tree and the different size discs that were used in the game. So within the paper, there were two main calculations kind of done. So the first is depth of calculation. As quoted from the paper, it is how far into the future they look. So to describe this, if you look at the image on the right, if someone just looks one row ahead, then they're gonna choose the node that's of higher value in that direct row. If someone looks two rows ahead, they're gonna find the highest one in that row and compare it to the highest one in the first row in order to kind of weigh which one they're gonna to go to. So the one who chooses to go towards 81 had a depth of calculation of two, and the one who chose to go to 64 had depth of calculation of one. And then there's the recalculation period. So the recalculation period is how often they attempted to incorporate new information about their future awards. So as you can see in the right picture as well, that top row is blurred. So as you continue to move up, new layers are released. And the recalculation period is how many of those nodes on that row you kind of consider and take all the way back to your current node in order to calculate, you know, is 81 plus 16 greater than 64 plus four or plus 16? Because each choice you make also eliminates so many other choices because now you can't get to that far right side. The graph on the left kind of shows the balance between depth of calculation and recalculation period. So as you can see, so the purple line is the one who has a very far depth of calculation and the bottom is the row numbers. So in the beginning, the ones who have farther depth of calculation, they definitely, don't score as well as the people who are using shallow depth of calculation. And then towards the end, the people who looked ahead got the most points because they took that last row into consideration when choosing their path. And our goals and objectives, after meeting with Joe for a couple of weeks to discuss the existing project, our team decided to focus on how can we improve the decision tree game to accomplish its goals of studying multi-level decision making. We came up with four categories that would all result in a goal state of an improved game with enough data to write a paper. First, we wanted to change the look. Version 1.0 had no flavor, which was okay for the preliminary version, but we just personally wanted to spice it up. We came up with a frog and lily pad theme, which was inspired by a game from Olivia's childhood. We called the game Lily Hop and wanted it to have a pixel art type style. Changing the look and adding a theme would make the game more desirable to play as well. In addition, we would add a player stats and leaderboard. This would encourage more people playing it, which would lead to more long-term decision-making data. We also wanted to add some demographic questions on the user, which would also collect another type of data. Finally, we wanted to remove irrelevant node choices as the user played the game. With that being said, uh, we would love if you all tried out our game. You can scan the QR code on the screen, or if you're viewing our slides, you can just click on this disk task link. Um, you do need to play in Chrome, and you might need to refresh a couple times to get it working on mobile or open it incognito on desktop. Feel free to play throughout our presentation or even after. So this is on the this right page. This is the game, the login screen. So this is what happens when you're a new user and you get shown the instructions and whatnot. And then once you get past that screen, you go on to the demographics page. So I'm going to quickly fill out this guy accurately and forward. And then you get to choose your frog. I prefer the little orange guy. And then you start playing. And as you can see, there is a bar in the middle on my screen, but that bar is to prevent the frog from going past it. And that bar is what we use in order to, like in the trials, to prevent and kind of control the depth of calculation and the recalculation period. And the last stats page, page shows your score for the last round. Um, highest possible score hasn't been programmed in yet, but will shortly and then the average of all your scores. 
So as you all just saw on Shay's screen, the game flow starts off with a welcome and instructions on how to play either mobile or desktop. It then transitions to a Firebase login, which is a real-time database. Once the user logs in, they're asked a set of demographic questions. And after the demographic questions, the user can pick one of three frogs to be their avatar. Once the user plays a game, they are shown a stat screen, which in the future will show all the stats, like Shay said, but right now it just shows some. As for the art, we created it mainly in Pixel and used Photoshop to refine and edit the graphics. And after we were done making it and editing it, we placed it into Figma and organized it there for the development team. Our homepage was inspired by a classic video game screen and the login page has an introduction to the game along with clear instructions on how to play, depending on if you play on mobile or desktop. The welcome page is supposed to disappear for every returning player, but includes demographic questions on age, gender, and the player's experience with other video games. So in the beginning of redesigning the graphics and after we'd come up with the lily hop theme, we began brainstorming inspiration for the aesthetics and the direction that we wanted our game graphics to go in. And as you've seen, we still created three different types of frogs from a bird's eye point of view, although some things changed. For example, I felt that an orange frog was more fun and had better contrast with the background than a brown frog. And we also tried our best to mimic more of a realistic lily pads with different orientations and sizes. And you can definitely see the influence of these initial blueprints in the final artwork and graphics. <laughs> So here is the final current digital art for our game. We want the player to have options for which avatar they wanted. So we created three identical frogs in different colors. And below the frogs are the lily pads with the different orientations I was talking about to make more of a real life layout. And most of this that you see on the page was created with Pixel. And here are the different sprite sheets for our avatar frogs. The sprite sheet is essentially a breakdown of the jump's different movements. And on the right, you can see how each sheet combines and works together to end up creating an animation for the frog jumping between lily pads, which is pretty cool. <laughs> All right, and on to data, which is a huge part of our game. So as I showed you the stats page and what's available right now, so all that data is being stored in Firebase, which is a real-time database owned by Google. And so within the database, as you can see this long hash code in, on the right is like each user's unique uh, ID. And within those IDs, they have a long number and the long number is corresponding to a trial. So every time you go through a round, all your data gets stored under that round. So this includes all your demographic data, every choice you make. So the nodes, the time that it took you to choose that node, the score of that specific node. And those are what we're gonna use in order to make the uh, same kind of assumptions that were made in the paper that Joe had done in 2015. On top of that, a lot, a lot happened within the back end of this game with Unity, Visual Studio, GitHub, C Sharp that allowed us to create this entire game and be able to stay on top of things together. On the right, you can see our commit summary. These are just a fraction of the commits that went into the current version that we have live. Normally you would start off like a conclusion page with in the end or in conclusion, but our project is far from over. There's so much more we hope to implement in order to make it the game that we envisioned. One unique aspect of our game is that it's a research tool. We will now collect data through the game and through online sources and online uh, study resources. And by focusing on creating an app, we can make it more widely accessible and easier for people to kind of play out and about. We hope to one day to do in-person studies in order to control the environment better to make more ac accurate conclusions uh, from the results. The format of this game is just our beginning of understanding the recalculation period and the depth of calculation. By making minor changes and additions, we will be able to discover a lot more about our minds and decision making. 
So thank you everyone for listening and special shout out and thank you to everyone at Pong who helped us with this project, especially our mentor Joe and Leanne, but now we want to open up for any questions. Fantastic. Woohoo. Uh, another game that I hope will one day be in the suite of games that help assess um, potential candidates. Uh, how, how much do you look ahead in, in your decision making? <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so questions from the audience. This group has integrated a lot of different skills. Um, could you paste the link in? So um, yes, Joe says great work, and we're we are definitely looking forward to getting data. <laughs> um, uh, Ming would like uh, like it if you could paste the link in chat for the game itself. Thank you, Emma. Oh, awesome, yes. there it I is. It. There it is. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, so we, you got you got a player right there. Any other questions for the team? It was a lot that they put together for this. So has, has it made you, I, I'll ask a question, has it made you um, think about other kinds of kind of, I know all three of you are cognitive science majors, but cog sci esque things that uh, you might want to uh, study with a game-based method? Um. One thing that I have thought a lot about is like, what if this kind of thing was used in like actual game developed companies, like big name games, um, and to see like what you can kind of figure out with that. Like, a lot has come out about how video games help with doctors and accuracy and that type of thing. So I think by using the same concept as taking in that data and being able to study it and make assumptions about it that's where it gets really interesting especially when you have such a large user base like that so i think that there's a lot of future in this to find different things yeah yeah for me um i i just liked working on like a team like in general and especially like that i could use um some skills that i already have in kind of a non, I guess, like classroom type of setting. Um, so that was really cool. And like, personally for me, I really like like quick games like this, um, where you can just like crack out around and then like close the tab or um, like in between like studying or something. I was kind of like a joke within our group that like I had like contributed like the most like data to the, the game, but um, I'm definitely excited to like continue like playing it and uh, hopefully like seeing like updates and stuff as time goes on. Wonderful. Yeah, since uh, definitely to add on to what Elma was saying, it was really cool seeing more of the user interface aspect of CogSci because I'm more of a neuroscience major on that end. So it was cool seeing how we can use technology to definitely study our own decision making <laughs> and also just getting to use more artistic mm -hmm. skills and getting to draw a ton of frogs was pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, and uh, and a point that we'll consider. We need to move on, but a point from Ara to to consider later that that you guys are in a, a decent position now to examine the effect of screen size, right? You know, so who I don't think they have quite enough data yet, Ara, but um, you know, those people who play on the PC versus those people who are playing on Android, how does screen size affect? Um, you know, if you get the same user in both places, their their um, scores, right? How much are they looking ahead? Because uh, we know we do know that people read differently on uh, small screens versus on large screens versus paper. Yeah. Well done. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Okay. And now the next group. Um, as those of you who were able to attend yesterday know that um, my colleague. Uh, uh, Dr. Natasha Baylock uh, has is hosting currently twelve groups, twelve, um, and, and that is awesome. One of them is uh, is about to present on the links between climate change and human health, and this is uh, one of these really interesting opportunities that can happen at uh, an institution like UC San Diego, where we have um, world class health. Um, research in our medical school, as well as uh, really unique um, uh, opportunities through the Scripps Institute of Oceanography 
and people who study um, uh, uh, climate change there. So without further ado, here's the team. Go ahead, take it away. Um, can everyone see the screen okay? Okay. Um, hi, everyone. We're the Climate Change and Human Health Group. My name is Ming. I'm Natalie. And I'm Casey. And thank you so much for letting us present today. So first, we're going to talk about the question we've been addressing the past two quarters. We were interested in the effects on human health due to temperatures becoming more extreme because of climate change. And this led us to ask the question, how can we utilize a machine learning approach to identify variables that cause susceptibility to heat illness and predict cases of heat illness in California? So a little bit more about our approach. The overall process started with initial research on heat illnesses and the heat health relationship. Um, we then moved to our data set and performed k-means clustering to create climate regions and use SMOTE to balance the data, which we will go into a little more depth and detail later. We then applied the machine learning models to our data and finally analyzed the results. So from our preliminary research, we found that acclimation has a large effect on the heat health relationship. Specifically, those residing near the coast were more susceptible to heat related illness than those in inland regions. Also, almost all the papers we read use statistical methods to analyze the heat health relationship, but in our project, we wanted to use a machine learning approach to predict heat illness and rank the importance of factors. Um, so a little bit more about the data we used. Uh, we sourced data for a number of heat hospitalizations for all of California from 2005 to 2013. Um, and what is classified as a heat illness could be anything from heat stroke to heat exhaustion or something primarily caused by heat related causes. Um, we combined that with daily uh, weather data for minimum and maximum temperatures for every zip code in California. And to um, add on some socioeconomic factors, we use the Healthy Places Index data chart um, which ranked economic percentiles, education percentiles, and other factors uh, that might impact an area's socioeconomic um, standing. So all in all, we had about 2 million data points for every day between 2005 and 2013 for every zip code in California. So now that we have our heat illness data from the hospitals by zip code, we first needed to decide on which factors to use in our machine learning algorithms. So as Ming mentioned, we decided to use daily info by zip code and this included maximum temperature, minimum temperature, and temperature range, which acted as a proxy for humidity. And then we also included other socioeconomic variables by zip codes, which were the percentiles. So this included education, pollution, healthcare access, transportation, population density, and uncrowdedness. Next, we used a correlation matrix to remove any variables that highly correlated with others. For example, we saw that the insured and healthcare access percentiles were highly correlated, so we decided to take out the insured percentile. And it's important because highly correlated variables can skew machine learning algorithms by giving more weight to those variables that are highly correlated with each other. And so it's good to take them out to ensure that our models will be as accurate as possible. Um, we wanted to test the regionality of our data. Um, so we wanted a way to label each data point with a region. However, since we're working with a thousand zip codes, that wouldn't really be practical to label each uh, data point with a zip code. So what we used was k-means clustering to try to um, turn those thousand zip codes into a couple more manageable regions. So what we did is we um, fed the k-means clustering minimum and maximum temperatures and it grouped similar zip codes with similar minimum and maximum temperatures together. Um, and that would try to kind of show the regionality of our data. So we ended up using 15 climate regions and we'll show you the map of those regions in a little bit. But this just attaches a geographic component to each data point. So after clustering the zip codes into climate regions, we had to deal with our unbalanced data set. So in the original data set, there are few positive cases of heat illness and many instances of no heat illness. To address this problem, we used a statistical technique called SMOTE, or synthetic minority oversampling technique. In our project, we oversampled the cases for heat illness and undersampled cases with no heat illness, creating a more balanced data set. With a more balanced data set to train on, our machine learning models will be more accurate to predicting heat illness. 
Overall, we balanced the data for each climate region and transformed a 200 to one negative to positive ratio to a two to one ratio. And then two of the machine learning models we decided to use were decision trees and random forests. So decision trees are human readable diagrams that separate predictions on clear delineations. So, so this means it basically creates series of paths that will lead to a predicted outcome for each data point that we give it. And then random forests are hundreds of smaller, more shallow decision trees to determine which variables will be used as decision points in each tree. And random forests are more difficult to read and interpret than decision trees, but we're also able to we're able to rank the variable importance and typically um, random forests are more accurate than decision trees. So we're trading readability for accuracy in decision trees and random forests. Um, two other uh, machine learning models we used were artificial neural networks and support vector machines. So you might've heard of neural networks. Um, these were built kind of uh, almost in the style of the human brain where uh, input signals travel through multiple layers or neurons, and each layer or neuron performs a multiplication um, effect on the input. And um, through this multiplication and like changing the signal, eventually it all gets filtered down and the neural network is able to recognize similar inputs over time. Um, support vector machines, what they do is they plot the data onto higher dimensional space. And what it attempts to do is to draw um, hyperplanes through that data to classify uh, the data as either one type or another type. So if you think about having a cloud of data here and a cloud of data here, it might draw a hyperplane through the data and everything on this side is one type of data and everything on the other side is classified as something else. So those are uh, support vector machines. So we're gonna get into a little bit of our results. Um, so we use k-means clustering to cluster similar uh, zip codes together into climate regions. So you can see here, we have 15 climate regions highlighted uh, of California. Um, we can see a temperate forest area up top in green, and we can see like a more deserty area on the bottom right. Um, but I want to point special attention to the coastal area, which is shown in yellow. Um, so the LA and San Diego coast is region eight, and the, uh, the coastal areas actually show up later in our data as very important factors that the machine learning models tended to split on. So it seems that um, that agrees with previous research done on the effects of like coastal acclimatization. And so this is the decision tree we created from our data. It has an accuracy of 82.3%. To read this decision tree, you start at the top of the, the top node and you work your way down to the bottom node. And this level indicates the outcome for a specific data point. So whether there was a heat illness in that area or not. And then this map on the right shows the clusters featured in the decision tree in one of the splits. And as we can see, these clusters are predominantly in the coast, desert, and central California. And so if we use this example data point in the middle of the slide, and we can feed it through the decision tree starting at the top node and working our way down, this model will predict that the, a heat illness will occur based on the information given. And these are the most important factors that the decision tree used to create the model with the factors higher in the tree being more important. So in this case, maximum temperature was the most important factor in the decision tree, which makes sense in the context of heat illness occurrences. And then other important factors were pollution percentile, diesel PM percentile, cluster month, and transportation percentile. And this is the random forest we created. It has an accuracy of 97.3%. So as we can see, it is more accurate than the decision tree. And the graph on the right just shows that the error rate of the random forest decreases as the number of trees increase with the curve flattening around 20 trees. And then the graph on the left shows the ranking of variables by importance. So this is a Gini index, which is about how many times a variable is used to split on the root node. And the more the variables are used in the split, the more important it is in the random forest. So if we look at the top five to six variables, we can see that's maximum temperature, month, minimum temperature, pollution, and diesel PM percentile, and cluster. And these are similar to the variables that were important in the decision tree. Um, we also use neural networks. Um, and uh, on the left, we can see a diagram of the neural network drawn out. 
um, and that's really hard to interpret. Uh, however, we have a handy way of ranking the relative like importance or weights of certain inputs. Um, so the neural network saw that it looked like clusters 11, 8, 15, and 7 were the most important clusters to split on. And I graphed those out here. Um, as you can see, they're mostly coastal regions with a desert region uh, in there as well. So it looks like coastal regions play a large part in determining if there are heat illnesses or not. Um, maximum temperature was also fairly important as that uh, makes a lot of sense. And also seasonality was also a factor as month seven and eight, which is the summer, was also important in determining heat illness occurrence. And it had an accuracy of about 84.5%. So to summarize, regions, seasonality, and maximum temperature were very important um, to the neural network. Uh, the support vector machine had an accuracy of 92.2%. Um, and it had slightly different variables being important than the other uh, models. It thought that uh, maximum temperature, minimum temperature, and range were the most important ones, followed by pollution and healthcare access. And on the left, we can see um, you can try plotting uh, support vector machines in two dimensions. However, it won't really show all the planes that divide up data points. But you can see that the red points are positive instances and the black points are negative instances. Um, so support vector machines thought that temperature and uh, humidity were the most important factors. So from the work that we've done so far, we can see that the accuracy of the machine models were all pretty good or above 80%, even though some were more accurate than others, some were more difficult to interpret and analyze. So as for the factors we identified as important for predicting susceptibility for heat illness, we found that max and miniature min, min temp, regionality, seasonality were, port, were important. Some other factors that were slightly more unexpected were the pollution and diesel particulate matter percentiles. Because poor populations are more likely to live in more polluted areas, they can be identified as at-risk populations. The disparity in pollution may translate to a disparity in climate change impacts in which lower socioeconomic populations are more affected. Understanding which factors can predict susceptibility can be helpful to implement in early warning systems for heat illnesses to make them more accurate and specific by zip code and socioeconomic status. So some of the problems that we faced um, those include learning a new language. We all had to learn how to code in R and use machine learning algorithms. Also picking which variables to include and understand what they meant was something we also struggled with throughout the process. And lastly, coming from different academic backgrounds and coding experiences, it was hard at first to come to an agreement on how to approach the problem and divide the work. However, we found that our different backgrounds gave us a more unique perspective on the project, which is what we believe this AIP course is all about. Um, some next steps we would like to take is to further refine the models, um, maybe reconsider what variables to add. Um, we were also thinking of creating a wrapper system where you might be able to feed uh, several models, a weather report for an area, and then it might be able to predict uh, the likelihood of heat illnesses, and this might be used as an early warning system. And we're also thinking of uh, maybe publishing a paper eventually. Also, we might, um, instead of using heat illness only, we might also consider using uh, diseases that are exacerbated by heat illnesses, such as cardiovascular diseases, as a proxy to show the risks of um, higher heat. So we just want to say a special thanks to Natasha, Sasha, and Tariq. They have been incredible in helping us with this project, and we are looking forward to continue working with them as we work on our research paper. Um, thank you so much. Any questions? Wonderful job. I'm so glad to see that you've all been bitten by the research bug and also uh, <laughs> the, the um, benefits of interdisciplinary uh, collaboration. Fantastic. Yes, and as Shay says, beautiful slides, and, and it, was, it was very informative. I felt like um, you did a fantastic job, not only in learning about machine learning methods, but expressing them in a way that everyone else who's watching who doesn't necessarily know all about machine learning methods could, could um, join, join in this journey with you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> Thank you. Questions from the group? 
Yeah, I think you guys did a great job. Um, they learned the programming language, learned the new you know, aspect of a science and put it all together. So I, my questions for you, question for you guys is, what was the most valuable part of your experience in this project? Because you've experienced all kinds of different aspects of multidisciplinary, learning new things, learning machine learning, learning about climate and health, right? What did you, what's, what was the most fun or what did you learn? What did you appreciate learning about the most? I think, um, in, oh, sorry. No, no, you can go now, sorry, sorry. I think working in a team was very valuable since we had different perspectives on where this project would go. I think we learned some like great communication skills, just talking to each other about what we wanted to see in this project. And it was really interesting to hear about like our different perspectives and our different ideas. Um, I personally really enjoyed uh, working on it, like kind of from the ground up, like doing some initial research and then um, trying to like make sense of the data, working with the data a lot, and then like working through it step by step, like balancing the data and then seeing what was important. And then finally, like checking the pros and cons of different models. So I really liked the whole like process um, part of it. It wasn't just like one and done. Yeah, I'd have to agree with both Natalie and Ming. Um, for me, climate change is something I really want to pursue in my career. And I think that this was such a great experience because especially working with people with a lot more coding experience than I have, I got to learn a lot of things. And it really just opened my eyes to how many ways we can approach this problem. And I think that's really amazing. Wonderful. And I, I hope that uh, you do indeed pursue this further and submit that paper um, because that would be an awesome reward. <laughs> Congratulations. Okay, next up. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, we have a lot of um, uh, mentors who are from here at UC San Diego, but um, some of our mentors are actually from um, outside the university community. But Nishal is, uh, Nishal Mohan is the um, founder and lead of mohuman.org, um, which is a, a local organization that's, that's focused on digital equity. And Nishal is actually also, much like Mike Roberts, one of our new entrepreneurs in residence here at UC San Diego. And so today's group, um, Micah and Haozong, are going to be presenting their work over the last two quarters on equitable digital response hubs um, in collaboration with Nishal. Okay, take it away, team. Hi. Hello. So shall I share my screen for the presentation? Yes, as you're ready, yes. All right, so I'm Micah. I'm Paul And our project title is Equitable Digital Response. Let's go ahead and move to the next slide. So just really high level, some key takeaways from our project. We learned that solving and reducing digital inequities is really complex and a big problem. We don't necessarily have a solution to present, but what we wanted to do was bring everyone in on our journey through the evolution and our attempts to create a particular solution to help address just one aspect of this really big problem. And then toward the end, we'll go ahead and just highlight um, some of the things Mo Human is actively working on and some things they're looking to accomplish as they target their solutions for the San Diego Promise. So in talking about our project, it's really important to understand the difference between equity and equality. So this is a slide many of us have probably seen 
um, fairly often. But when we talk about systems and inequities, these are systems that are in place that simply perpetuate or exclude certain types of people based on age, sex, religion, etc. Here's some news during this pandemic situation. The majority of eighth grade students in the United States rely on the internet at home to get their homework done. And unfortunately, there is a homework gap which refers to school age children that do not have the devices or techniques to connect to the internet that they need to use to complete their schoolwork. And unfortunately, such social inequity is more pronounced for some minority racial groups. And some low income teens say that they lack resources to complete their schoolwork at home. There's a research that shows a quarter of low income teens do not have access to a home computer. And so this just really helps us understand the gravity of this situation and this problem. So our project targeted a specific area within San Diego, and that was the San Diego Promise Zone. And what's interesting about the Promise Zone is that it's one of 22 federally designated areas in the United States as such. And so to qualify for this, unemployment or actually in the, in the Promise Zone it's particularly high. There's estimates around 15, 35 to 40%. The map is kind of small, but this is the geographic area that our project was focused on with the goal of then in the future using whatever solution we would come up with uh, could be emulated for other areas with, with similar qualities. So market research, currently free and low cost digital services are difficult to find. And in those, in those that's less developed areas and specifically in the San Diego Promise law, insufficient broadband bandwidth leading to connectivity issues. And also price is an important concern for the digitally underserved. Moreover, uh, digitally dis disadvantaged groups lack the skill to benefit from digital devices. So although More Human is a nonprofit organization, there is a potential market that means there is a potential population that needs corresponding service. What challenges do we face? Uh, first, it's as we see from the rapid development and wide application of digital technology, there has been a new inequality in our society. There is digital inequity. And we shall also see that there is a Matthew effect that digitally disadvantaged groups tend to be increasingly in disadvantages because they cannot access to digital techniques that cannot benefit from it, and this just increase the gap. The difficulties faced by these people are not only the prices of equipment as service, but also the access to information, and that forms a vicious circle. Specifically, in the San Diego Promise Zone, there has not been an organization that is actively, actively identifying and proving a target solution to help meet the digital needs and to improve digital inequity in the communities. So how can we possibly overcome the issues? Well, uh, digital technology is a double-edged sword. So it is not only possible to in, to make the inequity worse, but if we can use the uh, 
appropriately, it can also improve social inequity. For example, in some cases, disadvantaged groups can use the internet to enhance the offline social capital and reconstruct social inequity. So it is significant to make those digitally disadvantaged groups to obtain digital capabilities and corresponding material conditions to improve such inequity. And And that's our, Mahilma is funded by our mentor, Dr. Nishal Mohan. And it aims at creating a platform to allow those digitally disadvantaged groups to assess low cost digital service. They, sh they can find service, they can get connected and, and they can grow digitally. And how do we apply what we have learned? Well, uh, according to social network theory, the world is composed of multiple layers of network. And the network is composed of diversified relationships. Social resources flow through the channels of relationships. The most important feature of social network research is that the interpretation of behavior should follow the structural constraints of behavior rather than the internal driving force of actors. So by paying attention to the relationship and interaction of different nodes and different levels in, <coughs> in digital disadvantaged groups and digital technology, we have to create a three tier network structural diagram. And this helps us clarify our ideas for solving digital inequity and provides a reference framework for subsequent platform construction. So as you can see, we classify different features into three layers and they interact with each other and this adjusts the needs of those digitally disadvantaged groups. And how do we apply what we have learned? So based on the previous analysis, we have established a label system for the platform that is relatively balanced in terms of simplicity and accuracy, aiming to allow users who use the platform and they, really, they are really unfamiliar with digital techniques to easily obtain the information they need. Although the practical solution to digital inequity is relatively new and there are relatively few competitors in the San Diego area, we also notice that there are many service platforms that focus on other areas, such as education, medical care, food, job, or legal service. Considering the clustering phenomenon in the small world network, we believe that establishing a certain degree of mutual recommendation mechanism with other platforms and sharing the database is very helpful for the disadvantaged groups who need these services. So when we started uh, after conceptualizing our solution, we realized that one of the biggest things that was lacking was actual data that pinpointed who specifically needed help and in particular within the San Diego Promise Zone. So we spent a considerable amount of time trying to determine that. So our solution would have two layers or two phases to it. The first would be an approach where we would individually or the solution would find who specifically is in need of help, whether it be access or entry to the internet or experiencing people experiencing latency issues then the second phase or the second layer to the solution would be an avenue for philanthropic organizations or profits or businesses within the private industry private sector to present and provide these solutions to individuals that we've identified or that the solution we've identified within the promise so the next couple of slides are sort of the process we went through, some questions that we answered um, 
the format was in, in sort of answering questions to a, a pitch deck. So I'm just going to go through the next couple of slides really quickly. Our goal again was to, and this is the real world impact, was to identify specific families within the San Diego Promise Zone so that we could help adjust their needs in accessing the internet as well as digital literacy. The way we thought we could make this solution, which would have been a web-based solution, grow was to have families to share stories. So if you can visualize uh, Google Maps, we would have had pinpoint, or, or pins rather, uh, specific locations within the promise zone of families who would perhaps, via a mobile device, share that they couldn't access the internet, or that there were latency issues. And full cycle, we would have then, after resolving the problem, uh, created a success story. So we were hoping to get a lot of stories and actually have those stories as pins on the Again, we have some other entities that we thought would be appropriate in joining that second layer. These would have been other nonprofits, as well as broadband, broadband providers, and anyone else who wanted to help in the initiative. Again, we were looking to collect stories. Next slide. And to do this, we thought we would gamify it. Um, similar to Reddit, GitHub, there would be badges, points. Um, we even went so far as to perhaps think that local businesses within the community could offer discounts um, to individuals that contributed. It could have been you know, groceries, gift cards, something like that space. Then we also have to think about bots. Uh, we looked into some solutions, the like Cloud Vision API to perhaps monitor this. Um, because obviously once we had a collection of stories, it would be pretty hard to manage manually. And then or we didn't want to perpetuate the inequities within the digital divide. So if someone didn't have access to the internet, we didn't want to exclude them. So while this was mainly online, we also thought that having um, access by a mobile device would help address this temporarily. And then this is our thought process about testing the plan. Um, we would do it. We would have um, individuals within the community uh, test and provide feedback so that we can continue to improve the product. Another question we tried to answer, how do we sustain this? Um, in the end goal, we thought that the community could help out in terms of moderating and keeping the site up to date. Funding, this was something that we didn't really come up with an answer. These are just some of, some of the ideas. Um, Uh, things we wish we could have done well in the actual operation of my human. Any communities need to set up networking equipment to provide free or low cost services. And the reason is obvious. Since uh, we do not have the ability to provide a uh, well developed offline service, so it would be better to make those communities able to use online services. So Dr. Mohan contacts some engineering students in UCSD. And during this period, we basically assist with recommendations for Digify Me UI by comparing its strengths, its strengths and weakness to other sites within the space. And we wish we could have communicated and carried out the work more efficiently. And since the project is 
mostly based on execution. And the, the application of complex system and correspondent theory that we learned from the classes last quarter, it's mostly analytical and only serve as a guideline for us to to design and to generate our solution. So we are not able to write things like a research paper. So in the end, we would like to thank Dr. Mohan for working with us and Andrea for helping us through the two quarters um, working on this project. I personally learned a lot, um, just as far as team dynamics are concerned, as well as how complex just the digital divide as a whole is being a problem. So thank you again. Thank you for your presentation. I think you guys won the prize for having the most real world thorny problem um, that you're trying to, to address in the span of two quarters. Uh, does, are there any questions from the audience right now? So I, I know, and I, and I know that you, you also know, like uh, there, there have been some changes in Mo Human's approach actually during these last two quarters. And, and there's now actually with um, Dr. Ramesh Rao, who's here, uh, um, a, in a, an approach that is thinking about utilizing UC San Diego's resources through um, th this concept of uh, community um, wireless networks, right? And, and sort of level that, to tell me how, how, how do you see that through the lens of what time you've spent these past two quarters working on um, le learning all about this problem and the community? So the last couple of weeks we've and unfortunately, I didn't get to be involved too much. Um, was most of the population within the area are Spanish speaking. Um, and I don't speak Spanish very well. But that was sort of the targeted approach um, from the ground up. Um, and that wireless network with UCSD um, was specifically targeting those families. So in a sense, it was accomplishing the same goal we did, but in, in a more direct way. Um, I and mean, it's pretty exciting. I, I wasn't sure how much of that we could share. <laughs> That's why we didn't share too no, much. <laughs> well, so, so what's interesting to me, actually, and I'd love to hear your insight too, uh, Hazong. Um, what's interesting to me is that you guys were tasked with like this wide open question, like, how do we do this, right? Where, I mean, clearly, Nichelle has been working in this space, but wanted fresh ideas. And, and, and when, when the wireless network idea came up, it was it was so clearly a thing that wanted to be done. It was, it was like, well, you know, so so that group actually was kind of given an idea and their job is a lot more implementation related where I think your your group was was a lot more like, how might we very design focused. Your thoughts, Helzong? Uh, yeah. Well, although as my car, I also cannot participate much in the in the close I mean the just a couple of weeks ago in the the network engineering and information technology stuff uh, because that's I think that's that's done by some graduate students in the familiar areas. But overall I I'm glad I can have a chance to like, to apply what I have learned and to try to generate ideas and solutions using the technique learned last quarter. Very good. And I think you've applied it very well to an extraordinarily thorny problem. So so thank you both. And I hope I hope this has been a, a, a positive learning experience for the both of you and that you carry with it some of the lessons into the whatever problems that you you uh, find yourself working on next. OK, thanks again. And, and the next group uh, we have is actually uh, co-mentored. Um, this is the group that is going to be treating you to 
come uh, a glimpse and the waters uh, right so under underwater and surrounding Scripps Pier. And we have uh, Dr. Jules Jaffe from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, who is mentoring the group um, and providing the data, um, 3D point cloud data um, obtained through structure uh, from motion methodologies to, to um, basically try to char characterize these little creatures that we otherwise don't see. And Trish Stone, who is a visual artist uh, in the in the visual arts department, and also the um, gallery curator here at the Qualcomm Institute, she's also our creative director at Pong. Um, was the was the day to day mentor with these students, and they developed a um, game based experience to represent these data so that everyone gets to look at them. Hope you're uh, excited as I am to see the results. Okay, so uh, we have Shiv and Jasmine here. Uh, your turn. I'm just going to share my screen first. Is that visible? Yes. Okay, thank you. Hi, so our team is Mike or not, and I'm Jasmine, and Shiv and I have been working on this for about two quarters. So we all know that climate change is a problem and it's the problem that we're trying to tackle. On the right is the healing curve from our very own Scripps Institute of Oceanography and it displays the increasing amounts of carbon dioxide concentration per year. And we can see that for the past 50 years, it's been rapidly increasing and it's been correlating with um, rising temperatures on sea surfaces and um, and land surfaces. And but climate change is such like a large problem within so many other problems. So how do we tackle it? And so our solution is to create a video game to tackle the large problem of climate change through education and awareness. We're aiming to educate all audiences, both children and adults, by introducing elements of clay and curiosity into learning, which can be different from what we're used to when we're learning things in school. And we'll be focusing on the coral reef environment, um, which if you have seen corals sort of look like these tree structures, but they're animals. And we're focusing on it from a very small point of view, from the point of view of a symbiotic algae, which is a few microns in size, so it's very small. And we're focusing on this point of view because it's not very well known and it's very underrated, um, but it's very important in which like some of the important processes of ocean life um, occur. So our group did a few researches on coral bleaching and corals are animals who live in the ocean and they bleach when they die and as you can see, there's a picture on the bottom right of a bleached coral reef, and it's very sad. It's a phenomenon that's happening world, like across oceans worldwide because um, of temperature changes. And it's really dangerous because coral reefs serve as a very significant point for biodiversity. They're a very important resource for the marine life that live there, and they're an important resource for human communities who also utilize these for food resources and um, economic um, and for economic dependency, such as with tourism. Um, so as the temperature rises, corals become stressed, causing their symbiotic algae or symbiodenium to leave. And the symbiodenium are the symbiotic algae are like and our protagonist of the game. And it's also a source of food and nutrients for the coral. And so it gives its coral its color on the top right picture. It's a, it's a few coral polyps from the Jaffe lab. And we can see that these are a few centimeters in size. Actually, there's a mouth in the middle and there's a few tentacles. But we can also see that these corals, coral polyps are very red. And if you can see closely, the red dots on the picture inside the coral polyps are the symbiodenium. 
giving it its color. And so when the temperature rises, these symbiodenium are forced to exit the coral polyp, draining the coral of its color. And so coral bleaching is also caused by diseases, ocean acidification, and increased ultraviolet lighting, which can also be contributed to by climate change and rising temperatures. Next, we did some research on other similar games, which often falls into the survival and simulation categories. Uh, we have looked at Subnautica, which is a survival game where you explore the ocean and you try to survive on the amount of resources that you can gather. Beyond Blue took a more educational approach in which you acted as a diver um, and helped along animals and also scanned animals for their information. So a pop-up would appear where you get to see these animals' information and learn more facts about them. And there's also bee simulator where you simulate life as a bee. You play as a bee and you gather pollen and you land on flowers. And it's kind of similar to what we are doing, except we are focusing on the coral reef environment as a symbiodenium in the ocean. Um, and researching these made us realize that it was both a key and a challenge to create a game that was scientifically accurate, fun, and educational. So next we'll talk about building the game and trying to incorporate these. Well, so after collating the necessary research about the theme, concept, and learning objectives of the game, we moved into the development of the game. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we chose Unity 3D as a platform to develop all the aspects of the game due to the amount of flexibility that it offers. Our terrain creation process for the marine microenvironment started with the question of how to model coral polyps. Our advisor, Dr. Jules Jaffe, provided us with 3D point cloud data of such polyp clusters that we used to populate the environment. The first task was to figure out how to convert the point cloud data into game objects within the Unity platform. Next slide, please. While the input process that we proceeded with eventually was to convert the point cloud data into mesh objects and recreating the surface texture un uniformly with the same color. Instead of importing the polyps individually, we imported the entire polyp cluster as a single object, which also allowed us to recreate the floor of the terrain. We also needed to scale the polyp cluster appropriately. This simulation is played from the first person's perspective as the dinoflagellate, which is a single cell marine plankton. And so the corals were scaled up in size in order to reflect that. Finally, in order to complete the ambience of the terrain, the coral polyps are surrounded by a water mesh and natural light. Next slide, please. Well, as you can see, this is a finished terrain. The picture is only a snapshot of the entire terrain. And apart from the polyps, you may also observe some marine organisms in the frame. Next slide, please. Well, there are two organisms whose model was used to populate the environment, calanoids and symbiodinia, which are naturally found in these microenvironments. These models were created for this game by Thomas Circle over at the uh, Power of New York Gaming Center. These models have animations attached to them, and so, their movement is observable when playing the simulation. The count of the models were also multiplied uniformly to populate the entire terrain. Next slide, please. When we completed the visual components of the game, we turned our focus to the audio component. We were able to obtain naturally captured underwater sounds, courtesy of Aaron Tho, to use within the game. Along with the corals directly modeled from the 3D data, we aim to produce an authentic and scientifically accurate simulation experience. Further development of the game involved enhancing the user experience. In order to allow an intuitive navigation into the simulation, we created a user menu as well as an additional scene explaining the keyboard controls and actions available to the player. And we kept these navigation processes as simple as, and intuitive as possible so as to not confuse the user. Next slide, please. As discussed before, this game is played from the perspective of a dino flagellate. As such, the player is able to swim throughout the environment. 
there are no restrictions on the movement of the player in the 3D space. And navigation is performed in the direction that the player points to using their trackpad or mouse and is controlled using the four arrow keys. When the player is not moving in the ocean, they can turn their arrow camera to get a 360-degree view from the current position. And as such, we believe that these player actions allow the player to fully interact with the entire simulation and gain useful knowledge. Next slide, please. Um, so this feature isn't featured in our current demo, but it will be added in later versions of the game. So the minimap feature provides a top-down view of the map and all of the microfauna. So it can be used to relatively show direction and location in the game. Um, it will hopefully make the player experience better by um, making it easier to navigate and show relative location so the player does not get lost. Other than the functions that we have created for our simulation thus far, we also have some future goals for this project as we plan to continue this initiative into the following quarter. While our focus has been primarily on creating a scientifically accurate yet fun simulation, we would also like to develop this project into something akin to a video game, where the player has in-game objectives and so that we can increase user interaction. We would also like to create models for foreign objects like microplastics, which unfortunately affect these environments as a result of marine pollution, in order to make the user more familiar with such things. And finally, we would also like to create an inventory system to be able to store such objects and enable collection. Next slide, please. And through these six months, Jasmine and I have been so lucky to get help from and collaborate with a lot of amazing people. Firstly, we would like to thank our mentor and project leader, Trish Stone. She has been so amazing in giving us guidance and providing creative input, but most importantly, helping us a lot with the development process community. We truly would not have been able to present this project today without the help of Trish. We would also like to thank Jules Jaffe for not only providing us with the base data on which the game is built, but also continually evaluating our, pro our progress for scientific authenticity. Thomas Circle from Pong has also helped us with the animations and modeling for the game. And Aaron Thor from Scripps Institute of Oceanography has provided us with the sounds for the game. Finally, we're also thankful for all the guidance that we've received from the folks over at the QI Learning Academy, especially Dr. Leanne, as well as the Power of New York Gaming Center. Next slide, please. And now in this final section, we would like to dem demonstrate the simulation that we've worked on during this project. So this is the start of the game. The volume and the information sliders are over here with the information um, detailing the controls. Um, up, down, left, and right are usable, but I learned that W, A, S, and D are also usable for controls. So we can resume the game. As you can see from the simulation, as a player, we are not able to see ourselves, but we are able to see control as well as um, the marine organisms within the environment. And as we've just seen, um, we've created the underwater effect as well as given it natural light, so we're able to see these clearly. And now moving in towards the corals, we're able to observe the surfaces much more closely than we would be able to do in real life, given that these are in a microscopic scale. And we're also able to observe the animation and movement of the different microfauna in this project. The green organisms you see are the calamites and the red ones are the symbiogenium. And none of which we would be able to see in real time or in real life because of the size of these environments. And as seen before, the controls of the game allow easy movement and access throughout the terrain. And the, this navigation can be done um, throughout, and the section that we've seen is only a small part of the terrain we built during this project. And I guess that that is all that we have to show during this demo and simulation. We hope that you enjoyed our presentation. 
and we're now opening up the floor to questions. Thank you so much. Wonderful. So, so that is a very cool um, result. The fact that you have gathered all of these um, uh, hard won data, which I just learned, and I and, I, and I, Jules is very um, happy and willing to correct me, and I'm glad for that because I'm sure I made multiple mistakes in talking about other people's projects. These data are from the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, um, for one. And although it's 3D point crawl data, we did not use structure promotion. That's a different type. Of, it's a different project that Pong is working with uh, 3D point cloud data. Um, so, but this is a, this is great. You guys are in a really great place. You've got this awesome simulation of the environment. How do you see yourselves um, adding, like you're talking about making it into a, a, a more like goal driven, like ga games tend, tend to have goals and rules and what have you. So how do you see yourselves working with the microplastics um, in, in that direction? Well, so far, um, the plans that we have for the game in the future, we would like to make collecting the microplastics as a sort of side goal while it's storing the environment. So that uh, by uh, collecting the different microplastics of the terrain floor, we would be able to clean up the environment at least symbolically, and that would represent that we would be able to reduce pollution and in turn um, uh, reduce the negative effects on these environments. We would like to explore, explore such themes within the game and encode our users to such um, environmental objectives so that they may practice those in real life in any way that they identify with um, during the data that we have. Great, wonderful. Does anything uh, you have that you guys are also an interdisciplinary group, right? Um, uh, you're, uh, I know that Jasmine is an environmental systems major and Shiv, your major again is? Uh, I'm a data science major. Data science, wonderful, okay. So, so from a, an environmental sciences, uh, environmental systems major, Jasmine, what, what, um, what would you like to see happen with this, this game? Um, like Shiv said, I'd like to implement more goals so that we can see the story of the ocean as it's currently happening right now with the effects of climate change, especially by implementing things like microplastics for the player to collect. We can sort of see the player as a hero of the ocean um, by picking up all these microplastics, and we hope that would influence players to see the damaging effects of plastic in the ocean and other pollutants so that we can um, educate those about, educate about um, awareness and have environmental consciousness in the player. Fantastic. Um, thank you for entertaining my questions. Anyone else have any questions for this group? This was a lot of work. Okay, wonderful. Well, congratulations. And I look forward to seeing what's next. Yes. Okay, so um, uh, for the next presentation, however, we have a group that is co-mentored by our own uh, Dr. Natasha Baylock and also Marisa Westerfield, who is a, a dear friend and colleague of mine who used to be at UCSD and is now a data scientist with the city. And this group is going to be presenting about San Diego's urban tree canopy and how we might characterize um, the current state of, of the urban tree canopy. Okay, and so it looks like do we have, oh yes, we have all three students here. Um, take it away when you're ready. I think we're missing one person still. Oh, you are? Uh, yeah, I'm Victor. Have Oh, bummer. Um, he, is he, uh, are you, oh, there he is. Um, Victor is listed as an attendee. Um, uh, can you move him over? Um, there we are. Yay, he was just in the wrong bracket. <laughs> Thank <hey>. you. <laughs> I will share my screen. Okay. 
Is everybody able to see that? Yes. All right, well, we are the San Diego Tree Canopy Project, um, and we are comprised of myself, Madeline. Um, I am a second year data science major, and I'll let my teammates introduce themselves. Um, I'm Lulu. I am a third year COGS machine learning major. I'm Victor. I'm a third year math CS major. I'm Andrew Hernandez. I'm a fourth year transfer student in cognitive science. And this is our project. <laughs> okay. So the problem we started with is the health of our urban tree canopy is often overlooked. supplies endless benefits to communities. The urban tree canopy is decreasing on average by 0.27% a year, um, which may not initially sound like a large number. However, when you imagine the approximately 3.8 billion trees populating the urban forest, 0.27 translates to 2,260,000 trees. As the tree coverage in urban areas dwindles, the people who live there suffer consequences that many don't even realize are occurring. The health of our urban tree canopy is often overlooked, yet it supplies benefits to communities such as um, decreasing atmospheric carbon dioxide levels in highly populated regions. It improves the health of communities. It increases the walkability and safety in neighborhoods. And on an even bigger scale, it mitigates some of the effects of global climate change. All these factors contribute to a, social, a society of healthier individuals and a more sustainable urban setting. So in this picture, we get a look at both why the canopy is on the decline and why we have to work hard to counteract that decline to help the canopy thrive. The left side of the image shows how the vegetated area around the city stays cooler, while in the city, heat is reflected off of buildings and paved services where vegetation has little room to thrive. The right side of the image shows what cities could look like if we promoted urban tree growth. Trees provide shade, which cool local areas. This leads to cooler cities, um, where vegetation has a better chance of survival. So in order to have urban vegetation, we have to ensure that we are keeping up with the health of the trees planted and track which areas have lost coverage and which have maintained coverage. Um, in this image, we get to see that on this slightly smaller scale. Um, so on this smaller scale, we see that making simple changes to improve the tree canopy leads to not only increased vegetation, but more energy efficient cities and healthy, healthier citizens. Increased canopy coverage would not only reduce costs for the individual, but would reduce the carbon footprint of a city by decreasing their fossil fuel usage. As we see here, tree shade buildings reducing the need for air conditioning, which reduces fossil fuel consumption. They also absorb small particulate matter from the air, which decreases air pollution. These two factors lead to healthier citizens as they are less risk for heart attacks, strokes, and asthma because their neighborhoods are experiencing better air quality. Trees that contribute most to this positive change is large, healthy trees because they have the greatest effect on their communities by removing greater amounts of pollution from the air. This is why we must work hard to ensure that any vegetation planted be maintained throughout its life so it has the opportunity to provide this level of support to its community. So what are we hoping to accomplish here? By developing a tool that can produce an accurate and up-to-date map of the urban tree canopy, we would be able to identify the effects of climate change on local tree population, the impact of declining tree coverage has on an area, and which neighborhoods are at a higher risk for tree coverage decline. And therefore, we know where to send organizations to plant new trees. So that is the basis for our project. So the main goal of our project is to build and train some sort of classifier that's able to detect and localize where tree canopies are in satellite images. And we decided to do this over the county of San Diego. And by doing this, it'll provide us with a model that we can apply to satellite images from any given year so that we can compare tree increase or decrease over the years and also provide the applications and insights that were described in the previous slides. So the data that we had available for this project was mainly satellite imagery. 
Um, and this, these were taken from the ArcGIS data folder uh, and they covered the entire uh, portion of San Diego County. We also used shape files of boundaries of trees. Um, and these were like the ground truth labels for where the trees are. And we only had them for one year in 2014. Um, and we're gonna use that to train our classifier. We also have LIDAR data, which uh, we had available, but we ended up not using. And this stands for light detection and ranging. And it basically measures how long it takes for laser beams to reflect back from any given surface. But we decided not to use it, even though it's really accurate because we only had data available for one year. So we didn't wanna have a model that was biased or ungeneral ungeneralizable to other years where we didn't have this data. <laughs> And so for the tools we used to complete our project, we mainly worked in ArcGIS Pro, which is a geospatial uh, uh, application that allows us to analyze and visualize um, the models we were running. And we could also run our models using the deep learning modules that were available in ArcGIS. And towards the end, we also used Python and Jupyter Notebooks to test our own models. So the first step in our project was just to get comfortable using ArcGIS. So we first viewed all of the data files that we had available, which you can see to the image on the right. Um, it's a satellite imagery with the shape files of the ground truth labels of where the trees are on top of it. And those ground truth labels are just the solid purple shapes that you see. And to get comfortable with working with the deep learning modules in ArcGIS, we completed a palm tree health tutorial, which you can see on the bottom. We basically just had to label where the palm trees are and um, get comfortable with running the deep learning and training the model inside of ArcGIS. So <clears throat> one approach we tried was training a model directly in ArcGIS. And next slide. So starting off with our training data, the initial data set we were given contained roughly around 100,000 different tree objects for the Poway region of San Diego. Out of those 100,000 objects, we then created 22,000 image chips to train our model with. Uh, these had three band RGB data, and we were just trying to detect uh, one class, which was tree. So here's an example of an image chip, and on the right side, you can see the section of power that's carved out for the image chip. And on the left side, you can see the image label that gives you the bounding boxes for each tree object. So for a final configuration for a deep learning model, um, we used a ResNet 34 model to serve as the backbone. And that's a 34 layer deep model trained on the ImageNet data set. And then for a model itself, we used a single shot multi-box detector. And we chose to use Pascal Vark uh, rectangle format to feed it in. And you could see an example of Pascal Vark in the XML file on the previous page. Uh, on the detection side, we chose to use 0 0.5 as our overlap ratio. And then we moved any results with a confidence interval of less than 0 0.2 and a batch size of 64 to train. So here's an example of an early iteration. On the left side, you can see our graph. And on the right side, you can see the ground truth uh, on the left two images and the actual predictions on the right two images. Uh, here you can see that the model isn't actually detecting anything. So this was an example of an early failed iteration that didn't work out. Okay. And later on, this was our best iteration. Uh, here you can see the model is detecting trees, but there is still some errors uh, that we'll get into in the next few slides, but this is uh, our best result so far. And here's the detection for a sample region of power. If you can see the black bounty boxes being drawn on is the tree detection done by a model and the green shapes underneath are ground truth values. Now, uh, here are some ex explanations for our results. Um, these results align with a paper published by Weinstein et al in which they also tried to analyze tree canopy coverage using RGB imagery and uh, sorry, deep learning neural network. And two results to, uh, they found from their model that also aligned with ours was number one, problems discriminating between vertical objects and trees in general. So if you take a look at the top two images, you can see the little brown pillars, sort of anomalies, they're distinct from the background, are still being picked up as tree objects, despite the fact that they're not. Uh, 
And the second one was over segmentation of single trees. So on the bottom two images, you can see how the ground truth, it's just supposed to be around two trees, is being broken up into multiple single tree objects by the model. So after that, we also tried to train a model using uh, Python on our local computers. So the model that we tried to train is called YOLO v3. And this was a predefined model that's taken from the GitHub link at the bottom of the slide. And it was implemented using Keras and TensorFlow. And so just a quick primer on what YOLO is. It stands for you only look once, and it's a convolutional neural network architecture that can find bounding boxes around objects in an image. And it does this by splitting the image into grids and performs object detection on each of those grids. And then if an object is found, it draws a box around it. And this is really good for our data set because it can detect and localize multiple objects within an image. As you can see on the right, that's an example from the uh, data that Yellow V3 was originally trained on. And you can see that it can detect three zebras in that picture. So when trying to use this model, we first tried, we tried two things. The first was to train the entire model on our custom data set, but this was very computationally expensive and um, didn't really work out. So we also decided to try transfer learning on Yolo V3. And the data we used was just the image chips that we used for um, the ArcGIS mo uh, models as well. Um, so for transfer learning, we tried to freeze all of the early weights and except for the last two hidden layers and then train on just those last two. And as you can see um, in the picture in the middle, it was really easy to load in the model and load in some of the pre-trained weights also. Unfortunately, we didn't really get to finish this part of our project um, and ran into a lot of issues. One of the issues that we ran into was that uh, when training it on the entire model, we had to do it from the command line. And a lot of the TensorFlow and Keras functions that were implemented in the original uh, in the original code were deprecated because they were from a previous version of TensorFlow. So we had to go through a lot of debugging and restarting the program. And also for transfer learning on our uh, own local drive, we had some trouble formatting how to pass in the ground truth labels of the bounding boxes into the model to train it. All right, to go over some of our obstacles, one of a one of the disadvantage we had when we started started this project is that our data set was just too large. For example, we decided to focus on a small subsection of San Diego. We focused on Poway, but the thing is we're ignoring lots of data that was left over from kind of like the side of Poway. We were kind of reducing our training set size, but even when we did a partition our data set and focusing on Poway, even then Poway has a lot of a lot of land and trying to run all of that, um, trying to, you know, sift through the satellite imagery on a on a Mac computer isn't isn't too going to be too easy. So one another obstacle that we had was partitioning the data and getting the partition data to export correctly. And I mean partition as in we had to take the satellite imagery of San Diego and of California, we had to reduce its size. And then with its reduced size, we have to get the training labels within this partitioned region to export correctly. Um, we also ran into some issues just with ArcGIS itself. Um, lots of us are kind of experienced in Python notebooks and being able to just pick up ArcGIS and its own embedded libraries and tools is it takes some time to learn. So just being able to use Python in a different way using their own um, shortcuts and commands was a little, little tricky to learn. Um, as I, I kind of mentioned earlier, we did ArcGIS, use ArcGIS Pro on, um, ArcGIS Pro is has more features, but we're kind of like, there's an issue with compatibility uh, with ArcGIS and Max. So what we had to do is we had to use a scaled down version of ArcGIS for some of our peers when they were working from their Mac. And of course, this reduces the amount of functionality that's um, offered through from ArcGIS. So this made it difficult to all work together synchronously um, at the same scale, uh, same pace. Another um, obstacle that we had was 
learning machine learning concepts, being introduced to the concepts is actually pretty a pretty big time investment considering the time scale we had. We had to learn um, concepts related to objective functions, what it means to um, to choose our hyperparameters, and each model, machine learning model, whether it be a support vector machine, a neural network, a logistic regression, they all have unique parameters that you can change, and this will the parameters that you choose can like determine the performance you get as an end result. Uh, for example, um, one of the things that we looked at with the, um, with the neural network model was the overlap. We see that lots of trees tend to overlap and we have lots of boxes, boundary boxes overlapping, and this could be an issue. But this, also, this is also a parameter that can be controlled in ArcGIS and um, in Python notebooks. And maybe next time in the future, we'll also look to see how that can affect performance. So some ideas for the future. Um, the neural network itself, uh, convolutional neural networks are uh, a very popular architecture for studying computer vision problems. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are lots of hyperparameters that can um, change the, the end result for, op, uh, for performance. And what we can do is we can look into seeing how we can change the number of hidden layers. As you can see in the diagram in the bottom right, we have a convolutional neural network or just a neural network actually. And the number of layers in between the, the first layer, the first column, and then the last column, the number of layers there is the number of hidden layers. And we could actually change that and to reflect different types of neural network architectures to see maybe that will give us a different result or whether it be better or worse, we could just still try it. We'd also change the rate at which our model learns. When we give it data and we feed in our training input, we wanna control the rate at which our model is learning. Um, Next, since we are working with such a large data set, one of the things that we can do is sometimes it can be sometimes it can be hard to find like small features within the satellite imagery due to image resolution. Um, what we could do is try to enhance the image and pre-process the data so that we're working with a uh, more higher resolution data, and this will hopefully give us better results in the future. And what I mentioned earlier is that we're working with a large data set. So to be able to find another way to partition it beforehand, besides just kind of zooming in on Poway through our ArcGIS software and then taking a kind of a small partition of that, maybe we can look into a different alternatives or ways to compress our data. And thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> you guys, I know, um, win the prize for uh, encountering the most obstacles that, that perhaps if campus were more open and, and you had the resources that UCSD actually has available to it, like computing resources, um, there would have been it would have been a lot easier for you guys to do what you were trying to do. And I know that you, you are to be commended for your um, uh, sticking, sticking, what is it, stick to itness. <laughs> because this was tough, right? But I'm glad to hear that you learned a lot about machine learning tools and uh, hopefully you're not um, uh, horrified by by uh, the idea of, of uh, engaging them in the future. <laughs> so wondering if the, the community has any questions for this group, not only doing engaging machine learning, but um, ArcGIS in, in the, the process and uh, hoping to look for uh, yeah, this group has had a lot of a, a steep learning curve with all the tools they had. We now have the resources, so the continuing cohort can actually do this on a larger scale, which I'm super excited to see. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to kind of ask them if they felt like um, their experience in AIP was, you know, what was the most valuable part of that experience? Because as I said, this team out of all of my team have definitely learned the most new tools. <laughs> If you, if you have some uh, some thoughts on that, that's great. But there's also someone, um, um, Mike Morgan, who just put a question in the chat. Did you consider using other parts of the spectrum, for example, Landsat? Um, yes, actually, uh, in the paper I discussed one of the slides once, and it, uh, um, an interesting technique they also used, and also a potential future model was um, they actually combined models analyzing different sets. So if I recall, they used a self-supervised one that was based off RGB. And they then they used um, a supervised, uh, I think, CNN model that was analyzing exactly what you said, Landsat. 
uh, and they found a way to combine those models, which generated a much better result at the end. So yes, definitely um, in the future, I think that would be an interesting way to develop it. Awesome. Um, any thoughts? If you had it all to do it over again, what would you change? I feel like it was a really great experience overall. And we definitely like, I think if anything, like we definitely got some knowledge in like ArcGIS and Python, but like the applicability of just programming languages in general, I feel like um, we really learned, saw like how these different languages can like expand and do pretty much anything I thought was like the most interesting part of this for me um, was seeing like all those applications like kind of come together and like we we tried um, but you know it was definitely an, a, a good experience. <laughs> Fantastic and it looks like Mike just added a link here for you guys to explore and Marisa is is uh, giving you virtual high fives um, uh, recognizing that you, you battled for every every bit of uh, knowledge gained. <laughs> so if there are no other comments, then we will move on to the last presentation today. Congratulations. Uh, way to blaze a trail for the next group. And, and hopefully some of you might want to continue on for that fun bit that they get to do, right? <laughs> you, can, you can help. Wonderful. Okay, um, so the last group is uh, also mentored by our own uh, Dr. Natasha Baylock. And um, this group, this has really become an interesting project. Um, Natasha and I have written about this in, in grants. Um, it has spawned no fewer than two other projects. Well, what, one, one directly and one kind of indirectly. Um, but this is uh, called the Curriculum Graph Network. And I, I don't want to steal any thunder from the students, but suffice it to say that at a large institution like UCSD, it is no small task to figure out how to enter as a freshman with whatever APs or community college student uh, classes one might have and an, an idea for a major and actually graduate in four years <laughs> with a major <laughs> and and know know how to get there because it is extremely complicated in terms of the requirements of different colleges, different majors, and different prerequisites for each class. So without further ado, team curriculum. Awesome, awesome. Okay, thank you so much, Leanne, for that introduction. Um, yeah, so I'll just get it started. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Jonathan Lee, and Grace, Lynn, Lynn Fang, and I are the Curriculum Network Group. Uh, our table of contents includes our introduction, web scraping, Neo4j, and Bloom. Moving on to our introduction. So the problem we tackled these past two quarters centralizes around reducing graduation time. I'm sure most of us at one point felt that they didn't take the most optimal course load. Maybe you put up put off a class for a quarter, think you could take it next quarter, when in reality it was only offered once a year. Or maybe you didn't realize that a course you put off was crucial prerequisite for other classes. As an example, a student must take, you know, DSC 10, 20, 30, 40A, 40B, and 80 just to take DSC 100 and other upper division DSC classes. And that means you have to take six courses before you can even start taking upper div DSC courses and missing one could delay your graduation. So whatever the case may be, students often aren't fully equipped to necessary information to plan efficiently. On the right, you may recognize some courses within your department that are integral to getting your degrees. So moving on to a potential solution. We decided that the way course requirements behave is inherently applicable to graph networks. Most courses have prerequisites that behave like predecessor nodes, and a collection of these will make up an entire graph. Using what we know about graph theory and graph algorithms, we can come up with a way to find the shortest paths to graduation for respective degrees. Moving on to our approach. First step was to web scrape UCSD course information directly off course catalogs. We then convert this information into nodes and, and build our graph network. Finally, extract the information we want using queries. The major tools we use are the beautiful soup library, Neo4j, CQL, and Bloom. Now I'll pass it off to Lynn to talk more about web scraping. Hi guys, I'm Lynn Lee. I will continue John to talk about the web scraping, which is the first step to collect data from our project. Um, so, we are, we are spending time to talk about how we're doing the web scraping and make it more universal. First of all, we are scraping from catalog.ucsd.edu. 
In this project, we have learned how to using beautiful soup dictionary in Python to scrape and clean data. Then we are using Jupyter Notebook to run the code. So here, there is an example of the short cells of our code to run through the course description and clean unnecessary information. Therefore, you will see the list of prerequisites for different courses in specific department. In the next slide, I will talk about the obstacle that we have, we have in doing the web scraping. So we have to explore in different departments to see our, how our code, code work and prepare for the further work. So in here, there's the example of the HK that we have to deal with. So it shows, uh, this is the example in uh, CAM department, and then it shows CAM 6A-B-C in the script, and we want to transfer it to CAM 6A, CAM 6B, and CAM 6C to create the prerequisite list. So therefore, we have to figure out the um, HKs in different departments to uni universalize our code. The more department that we explore, the more HK will be clean. So after two quarters, we have done 24 over 105 UCSD department, but there are a lot of largest department which are contain so many prerequisites, such as uh, computer science, biology, and then biology engineering. Um, so uh, after doing the web scraping, we are moving forward to visualize script uh, visualize graph database by Neo4j. I will pass to um, Grace to talk about this. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, my name is Grace and I will be going further in depth about what Neo4j is and how we used it in our project. So first of all, Neo4j is a graph database and it's a bit different from the databases we might be familiar with like spreadsheets with the rows and columns. And instead, a graph database will store data in nodes. And most importantly, graph databases actually treat the relationships between the data as equally important as the data nodes themselves. This means that relationships will be used in order to analyze and clean the data. And we chose Neo4j because it actually combines key aspects in graph data science, like visualizing the data very easily, allowing us to implement algorithms like the shortest path between the nodes, and it allows us to query for specific nodes or relationships. So for example, in this case, you could technically query for all of the people nodes um, that are related to specific nodes. And moving on to the curriculum graph network. So in the context of our project, we created our network with class nodes, prerequisite relationships, and OR nodes, which I will explain later. So in the diagram, you can see that the arrow direction does matter because class A is a prerequisite of class C. And then this way, we can count how many prerequisites are for a specific class. So class C has two prerequisites, class B has one prerequisite, and there are also classes that don't have any prerequisites and nor are any prerequisites of other classes, which we call orphan nodes. Um, above is a screenshot of the education studies department. And you'll see for the top image, you'll see that Math 95 and EDS 30 are both prerequisites for Math 121A and EDS 121A. And then those are then prerequisites of the following class for 121B. And the bottom image is an example of an OR relationship. So this occurs when there is an OR relationship within the prerequisites. And this means that EDS 268 only has one prerequisite, but it can be EDS 251 or 252 or 253. And moving on to a larger screenshot of the EDS department, you'll notice that this is a screenshot of some of the most interesting relationships because the EDS department actually has a lot of orphan nodes that aren't shown in this image. And it might be a bit difficult to see the directions of the arrows, but the like circular <laughs> giant interesting relationship area here is because EDS 120 only requires one prerequisite, but because it can be among many, many classes, it creates this like giant like flower of nodes. And moving on to our code, you'll see here that this is a screenshot of our code and we mostly worked in Python in Jupyter Notebooks, um, but in order to work in Neo4j, we actually had to learn the language cipher to create the nodes and relationships. 
And because we wanted to mainly work in Python, we created these functions with the cipher code inside of it in order to connect it to the Neo4j graph database. And moving on to some of our next steps, um, now that we have our curriculum network, our next step would actually be to determine the classes necessary for graduation. So this is just a concept map of what the next layer will look like. We will be adding this onto the curriculum network. So these relationships are no longer prerequisite relationships and now represent graduation relationships to the major itself. And now that we have the classes necessary for graduating, this is just a layer on top of the prerequisites. So you'll notice that the prerequisite relationships still do exist. And this will allow us to calculate for the total number of classes necessary for graduation. So in this example, if you were to take COGS 102B as a elective class, you'll notice that you would have to add another class before it to take 102A. And in this case, if 102A also has prerequisites, we would also have to include that because then that would be the total number of classes necessary in order to graduate. And I will pass it off to my teammate, Lin Feng. Hey, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Lin Feng and I will be introducing to you guys about Neo4j Bloom, which is a building tool for Neo4j. It is a very easy to use graph, visual, uh, graph exploration uh, tool for visually interacting with Neo4j graphs, as you've seen before that Chris has already introduced. Let's first show you guys a brief small demo for uh, eight departments using querying using Bloom. So we start with a blank perspective, and then we can query for all the prerequisite relationships within these eight departments, and Bloom will throw all of them in the blank perspective. As we can see here, uh, there are 425 classes in total that has that are involved in prerequisites relationships. They are either someone's prerequisites or they have other classes as prerequisites. And we can also see that there are uh, 102 intermediary nodes, which represent the org relationships that Grace has introduced before. So uh, we can see all the classes and the intermediate intermediary nodes are color coded and uh, it's kind of hard to see, but these connections in between are still directed arrows that are representing the prerequisite relationships. However, there are many classes in these eight departments that are not connected with anyone else. These are what we call orphan nodes. And by searching for all classes, Bloom will throw in all the other orphan nodes uh, so that we can see here there are in there are in total 1023 class nodes in these eight departments so that's how bloom is able to query uh prerequisites relationships and uh class nodes in all departments bloom can also allow us to query one specific node, which in this case would be one specific class. So let's take MAE 142 as an example. As you can see here, when we query for MAE 142, Neo4j Bloom will automatically zoom in to this node and will light up this uh, particular class. When we click on it, we will be able to see all the relationships that are going through MAE 142. So we can see here one of the prerequisite for uh, this class is ME104. Another prerequisite can be satisfied by two, by one of two other classes that are linked using the intermediary node. ME142 itself is also a prerequisite for another class, uh, ME155B here. It's also shown in this uh, relationship query. So let's look further into the inter intermediary node to see what kind of classes we can choose from to satisfy this prerequisite. So we can see here, you can either choose to take MAE 143B or ECE 171A to satisfy this prerequisite relationship. So let's uh, go back to MAE 142 and 
what we've uh, just seen before means that you have to take uh, to take MAE 142, you have to take MAE 104 as a prerequisite, but you can choose to take either MAE 143B or ECE 171A to satisfy this intermediary node prerequisite. Neo4j Bloom also allows us to visualize a graph for major graduation. So here's an example for the major in political science slash political theory BA. All the prerequisite relationships are still maintained in this hierarchical structure, but we can see here that the red nodes are the major requirements that you have to take for graduation. The blue nodes are the major electives. You can choose two out of all the blue nodes to satisfy the elective requirements. And uh, you will also need to choose seven additional upper division political science classes for graduation. And this attribute is to be implemented. It's not shown here uh, for now, but we are looking forward to implementing that to our graph. So here are some of the future works that we plan to do uh, for the following quarter, or uh, if how for how long that we plan to stay on this project. Uh, right now, the whole code runs on your 4 j platform, and we are looking forward to creating a truly independent app that allows students to interact with it and um, to query for however prerequisite or major graduation requirements they want. We're also looking forward to build a second layer, which will be the major graduation graph that Grace has introduced before. It's just a concept from now, but we are looking forward to implementing it. We can also implement uh, some more attributes, including the course offering schedule. For example, if the course is offered in spring or winter or fall, uh, we can also implement more co-requisites because for now we are only um, showing all the prerequisite relationships. Co-requisite will also be a huge part of um, the implicit relationships between classes. All in all, the ultimate goal for us is always to reinvent the curriculum representation slash visualization in the hope to facilitate successful and efficient graduation. Uh, we want to pay our special thanks to uh, Natasha who helped us, guided us through the whole two quarters and uh, also Pars, who also helped us greatly with all the coding and connecting to Neo4j. And we also wanted to thank Fred and Josh, who joined us this quarter as part of the new cohort for AIP. They also have provided great insights and great new ideas. So thank you all for listening, and we'll open up the floor for Q&A. Wonderful. Congratulations. That that was fantastic. I, I feel like you just haven't gone far enough because you're you're making this app and you're talking about it as if, oh, well, this will allow students to graduate. And I and I'd, I'd say that you should sort of like own your student power just a little bit more as like and maybe tip off some of these departments that are making it nigh on impossible for students to figure out how to graduate on time. And, you know, some feedback like if only you offered this course at this time or um, more so did you have any insights based on that? Like, if, have you seen some of these examples uh, in your work? Yeah, there are definitely uh, departments with very complicated requirements and uh, requires students to figure it all out by themselves. Although we have the help from advisors, but it's still a lot of ton of work, especially to look through the whole catalog, or it's even on different uh, pages that we need to search for. And uh, that is why we are trying to incorporate all the information. We haven't incorporated all, but we are looking forward to adding more. Definitely. Excellent. And you have a question here from Sarah Hacker, who works with us at Pong. Do you see a tool like this being used for determining efficient ways to change majors or add a minor, for example? I can take the question. Um, we are definitely thinking about using this in more like visualizing ways, as well as creating like course plans in a way. Um, so one of the uh, next steps would definitely be to create like a more interactive tool where students can actually select which classes they've already taken and which class and then we would possibly be able to visualize what other classes are necessary in order to graduate and if we want to 
keep making it more interesting <laughs> and like more effective, we would also be able to introduce perhaps like possible um, possible electives that would help you. And perhaps like, like you mentioned, if you were to change majors or add a minor, we would also be able to include all of the courses necessary in order to incorporate that major or minor. And that would also be able to help you better judge how many courses are possible and how, and how feasible it is basically. Fantastic. Um, so uh, that's a great, great response. And Johnny, you have a question. I do. Um, really great presentation. Um, apart, aside from being an event coordinator, I also um, academically advise graduate students. Um, so I find your tool very helpful for the students and also to be helpful to our graduate advisors like myself. Would you think of adding like an aspect where let's say a student wants to take a course, but it doesn't fit in correctly? and he needs to like have a petition written or whatnot, it could like email their advisor or advise the student, you need a petition for this, so maybe make an appointment. Because sometimes the students will like go ahead and sign up for the course, but or forget that certain paperwork will be necessary later. But overall, really great project, everybody. I really like your idea. I think that would be really helpful for students. I've also personally been in the situation where I find that I don't have time for a certain class in order to fulfill prerequisites. And then I would have to try and find courses that are equivalent to the course in question. Um, so I feel like if we were to implement like more petitions and like ways to figure out what the equivalent courses are, that would definitely be helpful. Fantastic. And I just wanted to highlight, uh, you guys got props from your colleague in cohort three, uh, Shay Ziegler, who, um, uh, who is in the decision tree project. She's, she's under the, under the, uh, um, uh, hopefully not, not an illusion, but that she's graduating in the fall. <laughs> of course she is, <laughs> but no, it didn't, it, it, it is kind of amazing, right? Uh, the, how, how you actually get there, um, uh, when, when things are not necessarily clear, um, on what, what your path should be. Wonderful, wonderful, all of you. So, um, and on that happy note, uh, congratulations once again, and congratulations to all the AIP teams for their hard work over these two quarters. I, I it, it certainly appears to me that you've learned a lot, and I hope that your, um, whether this is your first or 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 not first experience with a research project, that you now uh, have the bug and see yourselves um, willing to engage in project work that is not necessarily clearly specified by a, a, a syllabus, right? You know, you do this first and that first and that first, you have to do some exploring um, as you all have um, with wonderful results. So this is it. You will have the pleasure of coming back and watching cohort four finish their um, projects at the end of uh, spring quarter. So in 10 more weeks, we're doing this one more time. Um, and um, that's very exciting. And I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that you have welcomed two people from that cohort into your group um, as, as a number of other groups also have. And hopefully you can um, keep tabs on their progress and continue working on, on this in some way. So I'd like to step back for a moment and just thank once again on um, Joyce Huang and Johnny Nguyen for their support for this uh, showcase event. You know, six and a half hours of student presentations do not go off without a hitch, without extra help. And um, Joyce has been involved. Uh, whenever you get a message from Enrich at QI, it's Joyce. Yeah, so, so she, she's coordinating a lot of the um, educational efforts here at QI, and we appreciate um, all of their help to make this happen. And with that, with 12 minutes to spare, I say that you have a fantastic Friday afternoon and wonderful weekend. Get yourself some rest before finals. Yes. Take care, everybody.